This video was sponsored by Policy Genius. Hey, in this video, I'm gonna show you how I made this sweet outfeed table for my table saw. With all these cool drawers and storage and stuff. So, if that's something you wanna see, well, watch the video, follow along, check the video description for links to all the products I used. And if you wanna support the channel further, you can do so at Patreon. There's a link in the video description. All right, let's get to it. This is my table saw. I bought it a few months ago, and as you can see, it has no outfeed table, which means that cutting anything large on it is a royal pain in the butt. So I designed this solid white maple outfeed table on SketchUp. Well, it's not solid white maple. It's gonna have a laminate top, and it's gonna have some birch plywood in there as well. I went out and bought some Eastern white maple, because it's nice and hard. I got some five quarter for the structure and stretchers, and I got this beefy six quarter over here. That's gonna be for the leg assembly. Ooh, leg assembly, yeah. The first thing I wanted to do was start working on the legs themselves. Now to get the thickness of leg that I wanted, I needed to laminate some pieces together. So I rough cut it to length, sent it through the joiner to get a straight edge, went over to the table saw and trimmed it down roughly to the right width. And finally I went over to the planer and I sent it through on both sides to get a nice flat glueable surface. Once that was all done, I laid out my pieces so that you could see them. Really, I do a lot of stuff just for the camera, and this is one of those things. As you can see, I got four big legs and two small ones. I'll tell you about the two small ones a little later on. For now, it was time to start gluing blocks together. Now, whenever I glue up blocks like this, I like to sprinkle a little sawdust on there to keep them from moving around. Some people say you can use salt, but who keeps salt in their wood shop? Weirdos. That's who. I always have sawdust laying around and it works just as good, so just spritz it on there like a French chef, sandwich those boards together and put them in clamps. Once I got all my leg blanks glued up, I set them aside and moved on to milling up a bunch more maple to create the whole structure and connecting parts of the outfeed table. Don't worry, I spared you from watching the long, boring milling process over again, but rest assured, I took the time to mill all those boards adequately. By the time I was done with the milling, my legs were ready to be taken out of clamps and shaped to their final size. So I took them once again over to the joiner and ran them through on two sides, getting them nice and flat and perfectly square. This created a perfect reference surface for me to send them now through the planer and bring them down to my final thickness, which for this table is three and a half inches. Once I planed down all my legs, I had this big block of beautiful maple legs. Four big ones and two skinnier ones. I'll tell you about the skinnier ones later on. With my legs all glued up and shaped, it was finally time to cut them down to their final size. So I trimmed them down on both ends and they were looking crisp and clean, just like James Dean. Actually, James Dean is dead. I bet he does not look crisp or clean right now. But let's not think about that. With all of my legs cleaned up, it was time to start marking them for my joinery. So the first thing I did was stand all four of my outside legs up on end in the orientation that I wanted them within the table base. Then I marked each edge to make sure that I could keep them in that correct orientation. Now to hook all my stretcher pieces in place, don't hate me, but I'm gonna be using my domino joiner. You could do the exact same thing with a dowling jig and save yourself a ton of money, but you won't save yourself a ton of time. If you got a domino joiner, use it. And if you don't, you might want to think about picking one up. This is a perfect example of why this tool makes things so much faster. After using the domino joiner to mortise out all the legs, I switched over to the stretcher piece, used my patented hip thrust technique, 
boom, boom. And in no time, I had all of my pieces mortised out and ready to join together. But we might as well see a few more shots of that hip thrust technique. Before I actually joined all my pieces together, I wanted to first soften the edges just a little bit, so I got a quarter inch chamfering bit, plopped it in my trim router, and I went to town just giving a nice chamfer to all of my outside edges and the bottom of each leg, leaving the top of the leg untouched. Ain't no need to chamfer that. Then with all of my leg pieces shaped and mortised out, I just had to squeeze some glue and some holes, plop in some dominoes, and start hooking this thing together like an adult Lego set. I think I've used that line before. But it's pretty accurate. I mean, once you get the little pointy pieces of wood in there, they kind of look like big Legos and you just clip them together. So it's still valid. I decided that the best method for gluing this thing up would be to glue my two end pieces together first. And then once those were dry, I could worry about my long stretcher pieces that would make the entire frame of the table base. I thought trying to do it all at once would be a little bit much all on my lonesome. So with my first end piece all dominoed together, I plopped on some clamps and I set it aside so it could dry. Once I was done with one, I did the exact same thing to the other side, and in no time I had two beautiful end caps for what would soon be a glorious outfeed table. As you can see, I'm a little excited about it. I haven't had an outfeed table for quite some time, and I've had to make a few shady cuts, if I do say so myself. With those pieces dry, I pulled them out of clamps, and now it was time to do these long stretcher pieces. Now when you're gluing things up all by yourself, you have to get creative. I like to employ the use of calls whenever possible. So I cut some pieces of scrap ply and then using some CA glue, I just glued them onto both sides of my stretcher pieces wherever there was gonna be a joint. This will give me a perfect little clamping surface so that I can clamp right at the source and not have to struggle with overly large clamps and getting the whole thing together all awkwardly. So first I added my upper stretchers. As you can see, I just clamped onto those calls to hold them securely in place. And then I took those skinny legs. Don't worry, I'll tell you what those are all about here in a little bit. And I clamped them onto the stretchers to hold the entire base in the right position. With that secure, I added my lower stretchers, clamped those onto those skinny little legs, and then all I had to do was pop some dominoes in my other end cap and hammer it in place. Now that everything was loosely hooked together with dominoes and wasn't going to be falling apart, I could go get some longer clamps and really hold this thing together while the glue dries. But before you walk away, you want to throw a square on there and make sure everything is, well, square. Now you might have noticed these dominoed out holes in the middle of my long stretchers. Well, I added those for these middle support pieces. I thought it would have been a little too crazy to try and add those to my initial glue up. I mean, I am only one man, and I was pretty sure I could knock those into place after everything else was all glued up. Thankfully, I was correct in this assumption, and they went in without a hitch. They were held in place pretty good without the clamps, but I threw some clamps on there just for funsies. I mean, if you got them, you might as well use them. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there's these little legs here, the skinny ones. It's time to finally use those. Now, I'm gonna create some middle support pieces in the center of those long stretchers. This is just gonna prevent the entire table from sagging with the extra weight of the lower drawer storage. So I marked out each one of these skinnier legs and I went over to the dado saw and I just carved out a little half lap on the top for the top stretcher and then also in the middle of the leg for, well, the lower stretcher. If everything works as I planned, this should plop into place in the very center of the table and support that middle so the top stays perfectly flat and all my drawers stay nice and aligned. I just used a little off cut from the stretchers to make sure everything was gonna fit. 
the way that it should. Then before I glue those in place, I needed to pop off those temporary clamping calls that I put on. I just use a chisel. Most of the time they pop right off and if anything is left behind, it's just the last layer of veneer from the plywood. And that's easily scraped off with a chisel. And then you just have to sand away that excess little bit of CA glue. So here's our middle support legs. As you can see, we've got our two nice half laps and this should just plop into place and keep everything from bowing. The problem is it already kind of was bowing with that middle stretcher. So I had to take a clamp, reverse it so that it became a spreader and open up that gap just a little bit so I could pop it into place. At least it's nice to know this leg is doing what it's supposed to and keeping everything nice and even. Once I was sure it was gonna fit the way I wanted, I smeared some glue in there and the foreman decided to stop by. I popped on some clean, oh geez. Put your tongue back in your mouth, so unprofessional. This is the guy I work for, ugh. Once I had one side all glued and clamped, I went over to the other side and did the exact same thing, making sure that it was dead center in the middle of the table. Next, it was time to do possibly the most important thing on this entire build, and that was to add the leveling feet on the bottom of each leg. See, I designed this table to be about three quarters of an inch shorter than my table saw. You don't wanna make it exactly the same height as your table saw, because the chances of it lining up perfectly are pretty slim. So what you do is you make it shorter than it needs to be, and then you adjust the height with these beefy industrial leveling feet. I started out by first countersinking a little hole with the Forsner bit and plopping my little piece in there, making sure that that top would sit down in there quite nicely. And then I drilled another hole in the center for that little peg to sit into, just like that. Then I repeated this process on all five of the other legs until before long, I was done. Then you just screw the little bracket in place with three small screws and thread in your leveling foot. These will come in handy when it comes time to get this all flat and flush with our table saw. With that step out of the way, I flipped the whole thing back over and it was time to start fitting all of our plywood panels and really make this look like something. So I went over to the table saw and I ripped down some 3 quarter inch birch ply. Have I mentioned that I really need an outfeed table? My first panel is going to cover this entire side. Now you might be wondering, why is he putting the side panel in before the bottom? Well don't worry, I'm going to show you my thought process right about now. So when I designed the table, I purposely made it so that a three quarter inch piece of ply would fit perfectly against the stretcher and flush on the front. You see that? That'll serve two purposes. One, it'll make it very easy to install my drawer slides and two, it'll make it very easy to install my bottom panel. If you're still confused, don't worry. I'll show you what I mean here in a second. To hook the plywood panel in place, I just countersunk a couple holes and used a few screws don't need to be too fancy, it's an outfeed table. Then I added my other plywood panels. I did a half panel on the other side because, well, we're gonna make another bank of drawers over there. And then I did a half panel on the side that's facing the table saw because I wanted to create a secret cubby on one side, right there. Now, as you can see, because everything is flush on the inside, I don't have to notch out anything for my bottom panel. It's a perfect square all the way around so my panel will just sit right in place easy peasy lemon squeezy except for on this side because I put this half panel in it creates this little section where potentially I would need to notch the plywood or I can just mill down a piece of scrap maple the exact same thickness as that piece of plywood and glue it on so that now I can just plop two perfectly straight pieces of plywood in for my bottom panels. To do so though, I needed to create some sort of lip for those bottom panels to rest on. So I cut some scrap pieces of ply 
and then I just clamped them in place using a little scrap piece of three quarter inch plywood as a setup block to make sure that my panel would fit perfectly flush with all those maple support pieces, stretchers, structure, frame, whatever you want to call it. And I just held these plywood pieces in with a few screws. With my plywood lips all in place, it was time to cut out the plywood for my bottom panels. Did I mention I could really use an outfeed table, perhaps? Once my bottom panels were cut, I enlisted the help of the foreman. It's about time he did a little work. He was kind enough to hold the panel in place while I lowered it in from above and got it all seated. Once I got one side pounded in, sitting nice and flush on top of those plywood little lip things I made, I cut and fit the other bottom panel. Now you might be wondering, why even put panels on the bottom at all if you're just going to do drawers? Do you really need them? Well, my thought was this. The table saw makes a lot of dust. So I didn't really want dust coming up from the bottom and filling all those drawers. I wanted everything sealed so when the drawers are closed, the dust would stay out. With my bottom panels in place, it was time to start fitting out all the internal structure that would make up our separate little drawer banks. First thing I needed to do was add a middle support landing space for some dividers to be screwed against. I just milled down a piece of maple and hooked it in with pocket screws. Then before I forgot, I wanted to hook our bottom panels in place. I just tacked these in place with a 16 gauge brad nailer. Next, it was time for all of our internal divider pieces. These were just scrap pieces of 3 quarter inch ply, and I'm using pocket holes to hook them in place. Because it's an outfeed table, and they're not structural, and pocket holes are just as good as anything else I could come up with. So after drilling a zillion pocket holes, I just started plopping plywood dividers where I wanted them to go. Now when you're working alone, sometimes you gotta get creative. Sometimes you gotta use your head to hold things in place while you tack them in with a 16 gauge brad nailer. Whatever you gotta do to get the job done. Now you might notice as I'm putting these dividers in place that I also added pocket holes on the top of each divider. Well don't you worry your little head, I will explain the reasoning behind that shortly. In fact, I'm going to explain it to you right now. Oh, I thought we were farther along in the video. Okay, I'll explain that here in a second. For now, I'll tell you what I did to cover up this exposed little piece of plywood on the edge of the table. That was as simple as milling down another piece of scrap maple, spreading some glue on there, and hitting it in the place of a hammer. I didn't even put any clamps on it. I just friction fit it and forget it. Ha! <laughs> friction fit it and forget it that's my new tagline then finally I just threw another scrap piece of ply on this middle support on the inside this is simply a place for the drawer slides to be screwed to you want to plan ahead when it comes to drawer slides so that the installation is seamless a big thanks to policy genius for sponsoring this video there's a lot to be thankful for this season you got your health you got a full wall of clamps your family well Maybe you don't have a family, but if you have anybody that depends on you, an aging parent, even a business partner, there's a good chance that you need life insurance. We never know what the future is going to bring, and I wanted to make sure that my family was provided for in case the worst happened, and that meant getting life insurance. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. Here's how they do it. In minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. The licensed experts at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. So you can trust them to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying process. The holidays are coming up and I know for a lot of people that means money is tight. But that's even more of a reason to check out Policy Genius because you could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare policies. 
So you're probably wondering, great, how hard is it to sign up? Well, it's not hard at all. Here's all you have to do. Head to policygenius.com slash bourbon moth to get started right now. Really, that's all you have to do. Remember how I drew attention to these pocket holes on those dividers? Well, those are to hold the top on. That's right, pocket holes. So I needed to add a few more of those to all the other frame pieces on the table. Now I decided to use pocket holes to hold the top on because heaven forbid I ever need to switch out or replace this top. I don't want it glued on or tacked on in a way that I can't remove it easily. With pocket holes, all I gotta do is climb inside there, unscrew a zillion pocket holes, pop it off, and put a new top on. Speaking of tops, for the top of this table, I'm using a substrate of 3 quarter inch MDF and I'll be putting a nice laminate top on it when I'm done. So the first thing you want to do is bring that MDF flush with your outside legs on all four sides. Did you hear me just say bring it flush on all four sides? I hope you did because that's not what I actually wanted to do and you'll see my huge mistake in just a little bit. So, thinking I need to bring it flush on all four sides, I start cutting down my MDF with the track saw, getting all of my panels nice and even and perfectly flush, idiot, on all those outside edges. Once I cut it to the right width, I traced a line down the middle so that I could land it perfectly on that center support. You see, one piece of MDF isn't big enough to do the whole top, so I want my seam to be on that center support where it will be, well, supported. Also, this is what it looks like to cut MDF when you forget to turn the dust collector on. Yeah, I just breathed all that crap in. Once I got one half of the table MDF cut to size, I grabbed the other piece, wrestled it into place, and I mean wrestled it into place, this stuff is flipping heavy. Then using my other piece as somewhat of a reference, I drew a straight line to connect the two, and I cut that piece down to size. Whew, that was a little sketchy. With all of my pieces cut down to the right size, I realized how much of a moron I was. Remember when I said cut the MDF flush on all four sides? Yeah, that was stupid. I wanted them cut flush on three sides. This back side, I actually need it to overhang about two inches so that it can meet up with the table saw. See this little L bracket? That overhang would go over that and perfectly marry to my table saw. But like a moron I am, uh, I cut everything flush. That's okay. We'll just roll with it. We'll figure that out some way here. For now, we needed to glue up our two panels. Now, gluing them together is probably unnecessary, but I figured a little glue wouldn't hurt to keep that seam from moving over time. Although it's probably not gonna move because it's MDF and MDF doesn't move. But anyways, once it was glued together, I climbed inside the table and started drilling screws into pocket holes to permanently attach this MDF top to the table itself. This really shows you how truly limber I am. Once the MDF top was screwed to the table base, I decided to thicken up the edge a little bit. Now, I was trying to think ahead here. Normally, I like to clamp things onto my table now and again using the edge of the table surface to land a clamp on. And because I'm gonna be putting a border of an inch and a half maple around the entire thing, I wanted that border to line up with the MDF. So I added another piece of 3 quarter inch MDF to thicken that edge so that I could easily get a clamp on there. If that makes any sense at all. Then after the glue dried, I just lightly sanded all the edges to make them nice and smooth and ready to add our maple. But before we do that, I had to figure out my faux pas with the whole overhang situation. I thought back and forth about how to best do this, and then finally I was like, don't overthink it. Just glue on a few more pieces of MDF and call it quits. So I took two more pieces of half inch MDF, I glued and tacked them in place, and I flush cut them. This gave me a full other inch, and then I'm gonna get another three quarters of an inch because of the maple border, and that will be enough to overhang and match up with the table saw. 
Speaking of that maple border, it was now time to wrap all of the MDF with maple. When I'm mitering anything in with a frame, I always like to keep a scrap piece of wood with a miter cut just to make sure that all my corners are lined up the way they should be. So after making sure everything was in alignment, I just started working my way around the entire table, gluing and tacking my maple in place. I'll go back and fill all the little nail holes after I'm done and sand them down, and you're not even going to know they were there. So before long, I had the entire table wrapped in maple, and boy was it looking clean and crispy. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna be putting a laminate top on the entire surface of this table. So we needed to sand down everything. So it was perfectly smooth on the top. That seam in the middle, the seam where our maple meets the MDF, everything's gotta be perfectly seamless so that our laminate can glue down without any voids. But I want the laminate to be the last thing. That's like the icing on the cake. So before we get to that, it was time to address all the drawers and storage on the bottom of the table. So I plopped in a bunch of bloom undermount drawer slides. I'm not going to go into too much detail on installing these. If you want that information, there's a video you can watch and I will link it above right now. After I got all my drawer slides installed, I measured for my drawers and then I started, well, making a bunch of drawers. I used Baltic birch for this, made all my drawer boxes, glued them together in my classic fashion, and in no time I had some, well, gigantic drawers. So big I had to use a step stool to put them all together. Once my drawer boxes were built, I attached the bloom little orange clippy things on the bottom side, and I slid and clipped them into place. It really couldn't get any easier than that. And then of course, because I'm a sick individual, I can't install a bunch of drawers without then going around and opening all of them just to test and make sure they work. So here's your classic rendition of Jason opening a bunch of drawers for no reason. Confident that all the drawers were working properly, it was now time to put drawer faces on them. The drawer faces were nothing fancy, just scrap pieces of birch plywood offcuts from, well, building the rest of the table. I cut all my pieces so that there would be a eighth inch reveal around the outside, a little bigger than normal, but hey, it's an outfeed table. Then before I actually install them, I wanted to drill out for my drawer hardware. I'm using these little poles and I have this awesome little jig from True Position Tools. You can adjust it to fit any hardware size you want. So I adjusted it for these little metal poles and I pre-drilled all the holes for the poles themselves. Now I wasn't pre-drilling all these holes just to get ahead of myself. There was actually a rhyme to my reason here. It's gonna make it much easier to install the drawer faces and I'll show you why in a second. Now to install the drawer faces, I cut a bunch of 1 8 inch spacer blocks and I just plopped everything in with a spacer block around all the sides. That makes all my reveals nice and perfect. Now, because these are inset drawer faces, all I gotta do is take a few screws and screw the drawer faces right to the drawer box with these pre-drilled holes for my hardware. It makes a perfect way of installing the drawer faces without marring up your drawer face itself and having to use any double-sided tape or clamps or anything like that. After I get my screws in there, I open the drawer, and then it's just a matter of reaching inside and screwing the drawer face in place from inside the drawer box. And you're done. Then you just remove those temporary screws from the front and you're ready to install your hardware. I did that and in no time all of my drawers were installed with drawer faces and that sleek metal hardware. And we were ready to move on to the creme de la resistance. Is that even a saying? Did I just say cream of the resistance? Anyways, the top of the outfeed table, which is this black Formica laminate. 
Now, if you're wondering where I got this, this is easy to procure. You can go to any flooring store, counter store. I think you can even order it from Home Depot. It comes in a million different colors and you can get four by eight sheets or this five by 12 sheet. I scored it, I snapped it to the right size and I was ready to hook it down. Now I'm gonna rush through this process a little bit because next week I'm coming out with another video that's gonna be all about exactly step-by-step -step how you add laminate to the top of a work surface. So I'll go into detail in that video and I will spare you in this video. Basically, once you get your piece cut to size, you add contact cement to the top of your work surface, you add contact cement to the bottom of your laminate, you throw in some little spacer pieces of wood so that you don't accidentally glue the laminate where you don't want it to be, and you plop it in place. And then it's just a matter of slowly removing those spacer pieces of wood and pressing the laminate onto the top of your work surface. It's really that simple, but don't worry, I'll do a full video on it next week so stay tuned for that as you can see in no time flat i had my entire work surface covered in this black laminate and now we were ready to make it look pretty and by make it look pretty i mean just take a router with a chamfer bit and trim down all the edges this simultaneously softens the edge and trims down the laminate to the perfect size leaving a beautiful edge and a beautiful chip-free surface. That's really all I have to say about the whole routering process, but I took a lot of footage of it, so I'm just gonna keep talking while you watch me do it because it's kind of satisfying to see the thing just become all clean. And with the last edge routered, the table was finished. Clean, simple, and most importantly, functional. Now it was time to move it over to the oh, table saw. Oh, but how? Ah, I got an idea. Now I didn't want to put workbench raising casters on the outside of each leg because they stick out and I'd trip over them. And I didn't want to put casters on the bottom because that would make it hard to level out the table against the table saw. Thankfully, Rockler makes these sweet removable caster plates and all you do is hook the plate on and then take your traditional workbench raising caster and slide it in there. Then you take this little metal pin thing right here and lock it in place. Once you move your workbench where you want it, you just unhook the casters and store them away. I'll just throw them in one of the drawers on the outfeed table. It's a great solution when you need casters, but you don't want casters in the way all the time. So after putting all my plates on, I just lifted up the table nice and easy. And then it was just a simple matter of rolling it over to my table saw and lining everything up. You also want to think ahead when you're building your table, like I did. As you can see, I made mine high enough that all of the dust collection and everything can just fit right underneath. Some people might say that's a waste of space, I could have added more storage under there, but how much frickin' storage do you really need in an outfeed table? This will allow me to run the dust collection, I can still sweep under there, and, well, my son can crawl under there if he's trying to escape zombies or something like that. Once I got it roughly in place, I lowered it down off of those casters and it was already pretty close to the right height. There was just a little fine tuning to do which could be easily done because I had the foresight to put on those adjustable feet. How about that? So I got down on the floor, got myself covered in sawdust and I just raised or lowered those as needed until the entire surface met up perfectly with my table saw. Then there was just one last thing that needed to be addressed, and that was cutting out some slots that would perfectly match up with the miter slots on the table saw. This way I can use a miter fence or anything like that, and it's not gonna just run into the outfeed table. I went back and forth on how to do this. I mean, the simple way to do it would just be to put a track down and run a router and cut some grooves. But 
why use a normal router when I have a ridiculously fancy Shaper Origin? So I just threw down some tape, I designed my grooves on the machine itself, and in no time I had perfect slots cut out with a nice little radius on the end that just made it look that much fancier. I removed my tape, I pushed the table back up against the table saw, and now all I had to do was just double check and see how good at measuring I was. Hey, pretty darn good. And with that, the last thing to do was to remove these casters for this will be the permanent home of this table. And I really don't wanna trip over these casters every time I walk by. The outfeed table was done and I could not be more excited. Gone are the days of taking my life into my own hands trying to run full 4x8 sheets of plywood through the table saw with zero outfeed. Oh, the glorious fun we shall have. Now it occurred to me, you might be wondering, what is this little compartment cubby I left open under the table saw for? Well, that's pretty simple. You see, when you're a grown adult, sometimes you need a secret hiding place to take a nap escape life, hide from your wife. So with a blanket and pillow, all you gotta do is crawl under your table saw, lounge out, and fall asleep. The chances of being found under here are pretty slim. Well, there you have it. I build an outfeed table. If you wanna build an outfeed table, well there's a link to a full set of plans for this exact table in the video description. So check that out. There's also a link to all sorts of plans on my website for past projects, a link to my Patreon page if you want to support the channel in that way, and of course, links to all the products you saw me use building this thing. So, I'm gonna go run some plywood through here, because I can't wait!